Not to mention every vehicle in the range will feature a hybrid engine by the mid-2020s. Aston Martin is taking the fight to Ferrari and McLaren with a unique sports car offering all its own, positioned just underneath the high horsepower Valkyrie. We won't see it for a few years, unfortunately, but when it does arrive, it will reportedly come powered by a mid-mounted engine, just like the 488 and 720s, but unlike its rivals, it may feature a turbocharged V6. According to Andy Palmer, in an interview with the Financial Times, the CEO let slip that the Mark's upcoming sports car will forego a V12 or V8 in place of a smaller V6, and a manual gearbox. Part of the reasoning being displacement-based laws that would prevent the company from selling the supercar in markets like China without having to pay a hefty tax. Other details like price, horsepower, and design remain a mystery, but we do know that it will be launched about a year after the DBX crossover, likely somewhere towards the tail end of 2020. Alongside with the upcoming V6-powered sports car, Aston Martin will also introduce a range of hybridized and electric vehicles, sometime in the mid-2020s, with a plan for a fully electric lineup by the year 2030. We will be 100% hybrid by the middle of the 2020s, Palmer said in the interview. Unlike its current AMG-sourced V8s, Palmer admits that the battery and hybrid technology development need to be kept inside the company, saying, that's why we make our own V12 engine. We believe that EVs are a core technology, and therefore we want to do them ourselves. The first fully electric car that Aston Martin is scheduled to introduce will be the Rapide sedan, followed shortly thereafter by the DBX crossover. Both cars will be built at Aston's new state-of-the-art Wales production facility alongside the DB11 sports car. The upcoming mid-engine sports car, meanwhile, will be built at Aston Martin's Gaydon, UK facility with development led by former Ferrari Max Swatch. Swatch will work together with design chief Marek Reichman in development of the new model. Maserati put the Ghibli under the knife for 2018, refreshing its entry-level sedan to keep pace in the hyper-competitive segment. This is the first time the Ghibli has been updated since its introduction in 2013, and it comes with a raft of changes that extend beyond the new face. The 2018 Maserati Ghibli wears redesigned front and rear bumpers, along with new LED headlights and different grille. This new profile is lithe improving aerodynamic efficiency by an impressive 7% when compared to the older model. Powertrains received some attention as well. The top 3.0-liter twin-turbocharged V6 engine now puts down a hardy 424 HP and 428 lbft of torque, a 20 HP and 22 lbft boost. This is enough grunt to shove the rear-wheel drive Ghibli S from 0 to 62 miles per hour in 4.9 seconds and the all-wheel drive SQ4 in 4.7 seconds. Both only run out of breath when they hit a top speed of 178 mph electronic power steering is new for 2018, making the Ghibli the first Maserati with the technology. There's a new suite of driver assists as well, including blind spot monitoring, lane keep assist, sign recognition, and adaptive cruise control. For when you turn off the main interstate and onto some curvaceous back roads, there's a new integrated vehicle control traction system to keep things on the straight and narrow. Model Pakage has been streamlined as well, with two trims now available. The Gran Luso predictably focuses on comfort, incorporating cosseting interior features like Hermine Gildo Zena silk upholstery. Pick the new Grand Sport trim and the exterior and interior will reflect a more aggressive and sporting character with unspecified changes. Pricing has yet to be revealed for the 2018 Maserati Ghibli, but expect it to be a touch more than the 2017, which stickers in at $72,850.
from the chopped windscreen to the partially covered rear wheels, this Zonda stands out. Pagani originally introduced the Zonda back in 1999 at the Geneva Motor Show and was supposed to retire the AMG-powered hypercar in 2013 with the track-only Revolution. However, customer demand continued to exist even after the Huayra's launch, prompting the Italian high-end mark to keep the Zonda alive through a multitude of one-offs. This one is a bit different than the others as it is not en route to a customer since company founder Horatio Pagani himself commissioned the HP Barchetta. The biggest change compared to other Zondas is the narrow windscreen lending the blue creation a special look while the partially covered rear wheels akin to the Zozo Special Edition are also a nice touch. Add into the mix the tartan interior cabin, a six-speed manual gearbox, and the body-hugging seats adapted from the Huayra BC, and you end up with one of the most striking Zondas ever made. Speaking of the Huayra BC, its Pirelli P0 Corsa tires are now wrapping the 20-inch front and 21-inch rear forged wheels of the HP Barchetta, which also takes advantage of some other features implemented in the Huayra BC and Roadster. Pagani's Uno di Uno division responsible for limited run projects did an amazing job as the unique Zonda manages to stand out even though it's technically based on a nearly 20-year-old model. A multitude of aerodynamic tweaks are visible, such as the front canards, sink-like central scoop, and the massive rear wing to make sure the newest Zonda remains glued to the road at all times. One rather unusual feature is the different design of the wheels from one side to the other, with all four linked to massive blue brake calipers complementing the body's lovely shade. All things considered, the suitably named HP Barchetta would be a good solution to serve as the very last Zonda, though we're not so sure it will act as the model's swan song since wealthy customers can't seem to allow Pagani phase out the naturally aspirated B12 machine. In 1997, it took AMG engineers just 126 days to design and build the awesome and barely street legal CLK GTR. Two decades later, the gestation process of the Mercedes AMG Project 1 hypercar, which has just been revealed ahead of its debut at the 2017 Frankfurt Auto Show, has taken years. The long awaited result. More than 1000 horsepower of Formula 1 inspired hybrid electrified design at roughly 2.53 million dollars a copy, or 2.275 million euro if your bank account is in that denomination. It began with the divorce from McLaren and with the need to eventually come up with an in-house replacement for the Mercedes-Benz SLR McLaren. True, the AMG GT lineup has accomplished a volume generating and brand shaping mission, but even the range topping AMG GTR isn't a true hardcore supercar let alone a mind-blowing hypercar like the Project 1. What AMG aimed for was a one-of-a-kind machine even more outrageous than the McLaren P1 and LaFerrari, the ultimate fusion of combustion and electrification. Originally known as X1 and initially dubbed AMG R50 to celebrate AMG's then-upcoming 50th anniversary, the project was kicked off in late 2014 by an undercover team led by AMG's chief engineer at the time Tobias Mowers, who later replaced Ola Kalenius at the top of the Mercedes satellite. In March of this year at the 2017 Geneva Auto Show, a fiberglass model without an interior was shown to selected customers. The private viewings took place in an anonymous cordoned off tent on the lawns of the high end La Reserve Hotel, where the gunmetal over black two seater was heralded by mowers as the next big step towards the future of high performance motoring. Out of a pool of more than 1,000 applicants, Mercedes accepted six-figure deposits from 275 carefully selected friends of the three-pointed star. Before the first car will be delivered in early 2019, a group of 12 pre-production prototypes have been queued up for demolition in comprehensive EU and US crash tests. As far as passive safety is concerned, we pulled out all the stops, states mowers. 
there will be at least four airbags maybe six and the monocoque is strong enough to absorb the pole during side impact. Shaped by Mercedes chief designer Gordon Wagener, whose recent works include the flamboyant Vision 6 concepts, Project 1 is indeed a striking piece of kit. Less extreme than Aston Martin's Valkyrie and more track-oriented than Bugatti's Chiron, it is visually and in content in league similar to the Koenig Segridra and McLaren's planned bp 233 seater The most striking feature is perhaps its full-length vertical aero blade, which is said to enhance directional stability at very high speeds. Wide and low, the new king of the Autobahn boasts a coke bottle plan view, uncluttered flanks, narrow cut lines as well as low drag wipers, door openers, and wheels. Smoothly integrated in the beautifully sculpted architecture are slim LED headlights, bigger than expected doors, smaller than expected air intakes, and several active aero aids. Up front, we find a pair of selectively blocked louvers, in the back, two flaps and the dual mode wing balance lift and down force. Unlike the Nürburgring lap record setting Neo EP9, which is all purpose and no comfort, Project 1 caters to rich posers as well as professional racers. Common to both cars, and the LaFerrari, is the blend of fixed seats and adjustable pedals. One can also alter the position of the steering column and the backrests, and there are three different seat sizes to choose from. While certain elements of Benz's common infotainment system look familiar, images taken by the roof-mounted reversing camera are displayed in the rear-view mirror. Instead of a conventional instrument cluster, AMG opted for two LED monitors one in front of the driver, the other in the center stack. The Quartic steering wheel is equipped with two controllers that tweak vehicle dynamics and tap other functions. Cabin space is not exactly abundant, but there are door pockets, a convenient storage bin with a transparent lid, and small recesses behind the seats big enough for swimming trunks, a bikini, and a couple of spare t-shirts. The materials of choice are carbon fiber, various metals, leather, microfiber fleece, textile mesh, and signature yellow stitching. It's a purposeful driver environment, minimalistic in places, comprehensive elsewhere. The detail we can't wait to put our finger on is the starter button that rests between the seats next to the window winder switches. Push it and your garage will instantly turn into a Formula One pit, guaranteed. But even though the 1.6 liter V6 does sound vaguely like the engine in Mr. Hamilton's company car when revved, it normally settles on a lower rung of the decibel ladder and blipping the throttle doesn't automatically trigger a rain of paint chips from the ceiling it certainly plays its own tune says the pensive CEO mowers. But the turbocharger makes still too much noise, and the exhaust note at high revs is, well, not quite legal yet. Underneath, Project One is a complex animal that takes modularity to a new level. Highlights include a steel platform that supports its carbon fiber tub, an adjustable multi-link suspension with transversely mounted push rods and a spring damper unit replacing the anti-roll bar, all-wheel drive with torque vectoring, rear-wheel steering, magnesium wheels with featherweight aero blades, and no fewer than five different cooling circuits. The 10-spoke wheels are staggered in size, with the rears being larger and wider than the fronts, and where bespoke Michelin Pilot Sport 2 tires size 285-35ZR19 and 335-30ZR20, respectively. On the inside are massive golden calipers that straddle sombrero-size carbon ceramic brake discs. While the rear suspension assembly bolts onto the engine and 8-speed automated manual transmission, the front suspension and electric motors are supported by a compact subframe. There are four electric motors in all, each governed by its own performance electronics. While normal motors rev up to 15,000 RPM, the AMG version's redline at 50,000 RPM. There are two front wheel motors, each good for 161 HP and attached to its own single speed transmission, the layout sharpens turn in and handling and supports an energy recuperation at a rate of up to 80% in normal road use. The third motor also makes 161 HP and is attached directly to the V6S crank via a helical gear, while the fourth sits inside the turbocharger, where it splits the cool compression side from the hot exhaust element. Q. 
capable of spinning at 100,000 RPM, the 121 HP motor inside the turbo eliminates lag while kicking butt whenever you floor the throttle. In F1 slang, this feature is known as a MGUH motor generator unit heat. Another F1 related windfall, the so-called MGUK, motor generator unit kinetic, spur gear, generates electric energy that can be stored or passed on to the engine mounted motor. As for the internal combustion engine, it comes straight from Mercedes AMG high performance powertrains, the Bricksworth, England based Skunk Works team that builds Mercedes F1 power plants. The direct injection, single turbo mill is by and large a blueprint of what's installed in the AMG Petronas race car. While the four overhead cams halves are still driven by spur wheels, pneumatic actuators replace the mechanical valve springs. To allow the car to operate on pump gas, the rev limit is capped at 11,000 RPM, which still marks a world record for a road car engine. At more than 670 HP, this small displacement six-cylinder is more potent than the 6.0-liter V12 that powers the S65. Total system power adds up to over 1000 HP and that's before you call upon the 50 HP freed in overboost mode. While a F1 engine must be rebuilt after 4 or 5 races, its Tamer Project 1 sibling is good for 30,000 miles, so don't even think of using this car as daily driver despite the extra durability. AMG remains tight-lipped when it comes to the final power output and performance data. The Affel Turbic Grapevine suggests a curb weight of around 2,650 pounds, which is remarkable in view of the roughly 925 pounds the battery packs and electric motors add to overall package. Regardless of the final number, Project One's estimated performance figures are suitably impressive, 0 to 60 miles per hour acceleration time should be in the area of 2.6 seconds, 0 to 124 miles per hour takes less than 6.0 seconds, and top speed is electronically limited to 218 miles per hour. When fully charged, it reportedly has an electric-only range of around 15 miles. As the bleeding edge of Mercedes' rapidly accelerating electrification efforts, Project One serves as a technological test bed as well as a halo for AMG and the Mercedes brand as a whole. While the hypercar will only be available on the secondary market to all but the ultra-lucky few, expect tech from it to trickle down to future production AMG models before long. There are now three variants of the McLaren Sport Series, Coupe, Convertible, and GT. Your friendly MOTOR1 car reviewer picks a clear favorite. Barcelona, Spain. Forget about the retractable hardtop for the moment. As I was driving rapidly north from Barcelona, slicing up Spanish traffic in a fashion only possible with 562 horsepower and a life-affirming shade of blue paint called Curacao, I found a button for the rear window. Powered rear glass is the stuff of forerunners and F-150s, sure, but in the McLaren 570's Spider, it's also a portal to oral delights. Opening the barrier between engine and ear, one is immediately bathed in the kind of urgent tenor that this 3.8-liter V8 loves to sing, and which wakes to a wail when I carefully flex my right foot. A full outdoor style concert, and you don't even have to put on sunscreen. After hundreds of miles in McLaren's latest Sport Series Stunner, I found a lot to report back, but the thesis is this. Subtracting the roof is only additive to the 570's formula. For those who may have missed our earlier reviews of the now 3 deep 570 lineup, let's review the recipe. Extensive carbon fiber construction, including the underpinning monocell 2 chassis, highlights a focus on light weighting. A mid mounted, Bitter Bacharged 3.8 LV8 engine motivates the slinky shell, leveraging the aforementioned 562 horses with 443 pound feet of torque into performance figures of 3.1 seconds 0 to 60, 
just 0.2 seconds slower than the coupe, and a top speed of 204 miles per hour. Moreover, all 570s are really pretty livable, with easy ingress into well-trimmed interiors, and enough space even for 6 foot something galoots like me to get situated. If you'd like to see someone a bit more reasonably sized behind the wheel, watch Alex Goy from Motor One UK, in the video below. If you're more familiar with reading exotic spec sheets than with driving the cars that earn them, let me just reaffirm that 3.1 seconds doesn't really adequately sum up what this engine feels like on full blast especially when rolling out from about 3000 rpm and a low gear the effect of a fully matted throttle is akin to pounding a shot of whiskey as you free fall from a cliff effectively palpitating and a little scary i found dozens of opportunities to experience this as i whip past tractors cyclists and slow moving diesel hatchbacks with barely a second's hesitation just a few quick downshifts by way of the paddles, use manual mode, it's good, and the 570 was ready to gobble up long bits of two lane in a few eye blinks. This tincture of lightness and power is, it's no wonder, enervating on the mountain roads that I encountered on most of the drive. The spider felt just as lively and agile here as I ever remember the coupe being. As broad curves turned into tight switchbacks, the utterly flex-free body and subtle suspension impressed in unison, rapid changes of direction didn't unsettle either the back tires, or reveal any compromises because of the open top. And though the Spanish roads were pretty much unbroken, the few swales and bumps in their surface were soaked up admirably considering the super low ride height of the super sports car admittedly i did bottom out once or twice dot mclaren's three mode normal sport and track adaptive suspension did good work on this trip i covered most miles using the middle sport suspension setting occasionally firming up to track levels for a bit more aggression on some very complex stretches of roadway and the soft setting was great for passage through the occasional village or when slogging through traffic on the way back to barca clearly the 570s spider is supercar perfect when it comes to powertrain and suspension tuning but where the car separates from the exotic herd is in the steering experience using a traditional hydraulic power steering system the McLaren is better able to deliver road feel and feedback than even its staunchest competitors. While on the gauzy subject of feel, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the brake pedal offers the stuff in spades. Exceedingly powerful, carbon ceramic disc brakes of 15.5 inches in front with 6 piston calipers, and 15 inch 4 piston rears were easy to modulate as I found by way of fast closing on slow moving traffic. Stop, and stomp, with confidence. Let's talk about negatives. You'll remember that I began this story with the assertion that, essentially, the spider is the best 570s you can buy, I'll circle back to that after getting a few small downers out of the way. Wind control with the top lowered is quite good. I'm very tall, and yet was able to sit fully ensconced in a turbulence-free envelope behind the windshield, and more so yet with the side glass raised. With that said, there was enough spillover to cause the sun visor to vibrate over about 50 miles per hour, which did get annoying while I was trying to drive the very powerful car quickly. I'm being picky, to be sure, but as a point of reference the Mazda MX-5 Miata RF I just drove doesn't share this issue, even at highway speeds. With the top raised, something that takes 15 seconds, 
and can be done at up to speeds of 25 miles per hour. It's quiet enough in the cabin to hold a normal volume conversation, or to listen to your favorite record on the excellent Bowers and Wilkins audio system. But it is still louder than both the 570s coupe and the 570 GT. Wind can be heard whistling off the rear buttresses, in particular. Another downside is that opting for the convertible top makes the 570s more expensive. Base price of the coupe is $188,600, or $20,000 less than the $208,800 it'll take to procure a Spider. Throwing the cost of a Mini Cooper on top of a car isn't nothing, more than a little wind noise. But I think it's also fair to point out that the customer shopping in the $190,000 range is most likely the same as one shopping in the $210,000 range, which is to say, filthy stinking rich. Also consider that my test car had roughly $30,000 of optional equipment lathered on, and you'll probably find that starting price a bit more palatable. Any other negative attributes that you might expect in a coupe to convertible transition are either negligible or non existent. There is a slight weight penalty, but it comes out to about 101 pounds, or the difference between having or not having a very thin boyfriend slash girlfriend riding along. In either case, you're a better vehicle evaluator than I if you can call out the difference on a road drive. As I mentioned already, there's zero rigidity lost in the translation, and therefore no dulling of the handling overall. And in terms of looks, I actually really like the distinctive look offered from the twin rear buttresses, in both profile and front three quarters view. Your mileage may vary on that one. Some folks just like the look of a coup. Want one, insanely antithetical, yet practical reason to talk yourself into the spider? With the top up the space under the tonneau cover provides another 1.8 cubic feet of storage space. Let your packing fantasies run wild. Having driven the 570s spider, I can't really imagine ordering any other version of the car, well, if the first production run of the convertible wasn't already completely spoken for. For a handful of Benjamins and a few extra pounds, the spider brought me unforgettable gifts, the rolling Spanish sky, dotted with high clouds and far away mountain peaks a better than ever connection with the sound and fury of the charging V8 behind my head, and close proximity to jealous and cheering sidewalk denizens in Barcelona. Oh, and, of course, that cool rear window. With the Spider, the 570s has reached its apogee, and you don't even need to lower the roof to know it.